I think we're all set. Uh, Kurt, if you want to go ahead and get us kicked off. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much to all the press for joining us today. Obviously, uh, this marks our is this the sixth special session? I think it is. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we're meeting again, obviously, to review the governor's emergency powers um, and, and certainly appreciate all of your uh, participation in this, in this press conference. Um, you know, we're here to talk about today a proposal by House Republicans uh, that will give the legislature um, some increased flexibility and an increased voice in the process. Um, and, and we hope that it will spur uh, more communication and more involvement uh, of the legislature by the governor's office. That's our that's our sincere ho hope. Uh, Minnesota businesses uh, and and legislators of both parties were really left in the dark. Even the last time the governor issued some executive orders, um, and it really demonstrates the governor's. Uh, unwillingness to work uh, both with the legislature and with folks who are impacted the most by these executive orders. Um, the governor does have meetings with the Minnesota Licensed Beverage Association, with Hospitality Minnesota, uh, but yet uh, when it comes to actually making the decisions, he doesn't include them in the decision-making process or, or solicit information from them. So, um, you know, this uh, really kind of demonstrates uh, that that getting a briefing from the governor's office isn't the same as being involved in the process, um, and that's that's how the legislature feels as well. Um, and it's not just legislators uh, who are Republicans. Legislators in both parties were finding out about the governor's decision, uh, many from the press and, and just hours before the governor's uh, announcements. Um, so we know that there's frustration by all legislators in both bodies and uh, in both parties. Um, we know that this makes it difficult uh, for us to communicate with our constituents. Um, and, you know, we have constituents all across the state who are begging us for information about what's happening and what the next steps might be. But um, unfortunately, we as legislators really have no information and, and the governor has, uh, has kept us in the dark. So, uh, you know, we learn about the, the new restrictions from the press in many cases. Um, and, and unfortunately, we have no participation in actually coming up with the direction for how we respond to COVID and this pandemic. Um, I want to introduce uh, Representative Barb Haley. She has really uh, been a leader in our caucus um, on, uh, uh, you know, working out uh, solutions that that might really help us move forward in a positive and collaborative way. Um, in addition to that, we're going to be joined by Representative Dave Baker, who has worked with her um, in many of these uh, uh, cases. Um, both of them have have really uh, tried to work across the aisle and include Democrat legislators in their solutions. Um, and one of the solutions that we're gonna roll out today is, is some modifications to chapter 12. Um, and, and we're gonna bring that up for a, for a vote in the House floor. Uh, it's a representative uh, Haley bill. Um, and we think that this would be a really positive step in moving forward and, and, and working uh, more closely with the governor uh, and, and having the legislature really be at the table and, and part of coming up with those solutions. So I'll turn it over to Representative Barb Haley. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Leader Doubt. Uh, this is Barb Haley. I represent District 21A. Minnesota right now is in the midst of the longest peacetime emergency ever in our history, uh, pretty much eight months to the day. The governor has enjoyed unprecedented powers and uh, in a lot of cases left the legislature out of the process. Right now, as you know, the only way for us to end an executive order is to end the peacetime emergency altogether, uh, which would end all of the executive orders. And that is not my goal. That's not what we're trying to do. Today, I'm bringing forward legislation that will be introduced in the House and the Senate that would give the legislature additional tools. And my goal is to simply improve communication and collaboration with the governor's office. My bill is fairly straightforward. Similar to the current peacetime emergency, the governor still would retain his flexibility and the ability to issue executive orders with the full force of the law for 30 days. After 30 days, the legislature would then have the ability, but we would not be required, but we would have the ability to look at each individual executive order and decide if we wanted to rescind that or make changes to it. Starting in January, we will have a bipartisan majority in the House will have voted in the past with us to end the governor's emergency powers. Without any changes right now in the process, the only option available to us would be to end those powers altogether. We all know that COVID is a serious illness. Uh, right now, the state is in a very critical situation. 
by bill does not change anything about our ability to respond to that. And again, giving the governor his emergency powers as they exist. All we are trying to do is get the legislature a seat at the table again. I would think that this would have bipartisan support. And as Leader Dowd has said, Representative Baker and I have been in touch with many of our DFL colleagues. We believe this bill simply gives the governor some breathing room, frankly. If the legislature does not like an executive order, an executive order that's having negative impacts on some of our constituents and might have issues that we want to change, this just gives us the opportunity to weigh in. That is what we are looking for. We need to be working very closely together to combat this pandemic. We all want to do the right thing. It's my sincere hope that this proposal today will receive support. And I will turn it over to Representative Dave Baker to talk specifically about some of the impacts to the hospitality industry. Dave, you're, you're yeah. muted there. There we go, got it, thanks, Kurt. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Kurt and Barb, for kind of teeing this thing up. Uh, as many of you know, I have been working in the background on this issue for many, many months, actually, with my uh, Democratic colleagues, because uh, facing this kind of epidemic in our business world in all of Minnesota has been a real challenge. And, um, you know, we have had actually uh, Zoom calls with the, with the Commissioner of Deed and some MDH folks in a bipartisan fashion with... Uh, Three, uh, three Democrats, a couple of Republicans. We're representing really 200 and some thousand people on a Zoom call at a time. So everything we try to do is trying to literally get things done in a bipartisan fashion. Um, as a restaurant operator myself, again, recently have sold my, my last restaurant. I still am in the hotel business. I really know firsthand what these folks are facing. And what I really, really like about uh, Representative Haley's bill today is it gives the governor the complete freedom to do what he's doing today. He can execute a, an order if he sees a need. Um, and, and we, as a legislator, then can take a look at how are things working in 30 days. We can listen to our constituents. We can listen to our, our schools, our, our, our restaurants and bars, and we can actually see what's working and what isn't. I have a lot of concerns about the recent announcement this week. And, and, and a friend of mine in my district, uh, Donovan, will speak uh, shortly about some of the concerns that he is having as well uh, with the recent thing. And again, even part of the executive orders that he announced this week weren't all that bad. There's some good parts about that. And it's nice for us to know the education that I have received in the last few days about the demographics of that group that they're trying to address. The problem is, the bottom line is, I have been working behind the scenes very, very hard to get the attention of the governor and the attention of his team I scratch and fight, and what they will tell you is that they are very engaged in all levels. There's a difference between having a meeting and have, having people feel heard. Uh, I don't like playing the partisan games, but I am not feeling heard on many levels. So we've got to try to change the dynamic in this conversation about really listening now after 200 and some days of an executive order. It's time now to start changing while, how we're doing this. And again, I appreciate our GOP leadership and our, our, our approach to not just doing the same uh, emergency orders resolution that will, will absolutely fall on deaf ears today, because again, the numbers are not working in our favor. Um, so with that, I just wanna uh, uh, introduce Donovan from O'Neill's and Spicer. He'll give us his, his full name next, have a couple comments on that, and, and maybe I'll, I'll say a few things later on, but uh, thanks again for being here, and, and Donovan, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dave. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah, my name is Donovan Frounding. I recently purchased O'Neill's and Spicer um, back in June. So we got in this right in the beginning of this whole mess kind of. And um, right now, I guess our biggest concern is all the events that we have planned coming into fall and winter. Um, some of these weddings that got pushed off from the beginning and um, now people are just, you know, finally had some room to, to fit them in our schedule and, and other venue schedules. and. Um, you know, these people have spent their hard-earned money as far as, you know, buying the dresses, renting the tuxes, you know, all of our planning and all the different things that we've put into these, these events, um, you know, and we're not really even asking or, you know, trying to get the, the extension of the 10 o'clock limit, but uh, 
you know, if we could just have these events and, and uh, you know, get these weddings and these different events, you know, through, through and have these life events for these people um, taken care of. And, and also just the, uh, the taking away the seating from the bar. Um, you know, I don't quite get the understanding of where, where that is uh, much more critical than, than um, you know, the table service itself. I mean, for the most part, our, the, the bar seating is, you know, for that, that one or two people that come in and, uh, you know, just want to grab a quick bite to eat or, you know, sit down and maybe have a cocktail, um, you know, then they're not tying up the additional tables. We're not having one person sit at a table of four and, uh, you know, restrict our capacities even greater. Um, so those are just two of the, the biggest concerns that uh, I kind of brought up with Dave and, and, we, and we talked about. And um, I just appreciate him giving me the opportunity to, to voice my opinion. And uh, any, anything else you want me to touch on, Dave? Uh, no, Donovan, um, that's really about it. Thank you for that. And my final comment really is just, and I'll let Barb and Kurt take it over. And um, Being in the restaurant industry myself, um, I just know that being involved in these conversations before decisions actually get rolled out would be so helpful. Uh, you know, and again, with, with Barb's bill, this would be a classic example of why this should pass, why any member on the House floor would vote against having a voice in 30 days. Uh, after the executive order is issued, um, would just be um, hard for me to understand why you wouldn't want to have a voice there. Uh, I think it just uh, would be a, a real lack of leadership and trust that legislation can actually do some good things too. But uh, 201 legislators representing the entire state of Minnesota have really been left out of this conversation about how do we best uh, move forward in a safe manner in businesses in Minnesota. So um, I just think this bill is a great, really well watered down, but yet effective way for the legislature to become involved 30 days after an executive order is issued. So um, I'll, I'll stand back and, and let the team take it from here. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, the, the other significant uh, constituent group that we have heard from in addition to the hospitality industry is our educators. Uh, many are contacting us every month regarding the executive orders and the difficulty they're having in kind of constantly having to change their plans. They feel quite disconnected from decisions that are being made by uh, MDE and being um, executed through the executive orders. The superintendents have told us that they haven't had input and they haven't had advance notice before the sweeping changes are needed. This needs to change. And this is another reason why, uh, as Representative Baker has said, we believe this is a compromised approach, a very reasonable approach that we're putting forth today. Um, I would like to introduce a superintendent who's joining us this morning that can give you some specific examples. Uh, his name is Mike Harvey, and he's the superintendent for uh, Zambroda Mazeppa Schools. Uh, Mike, you can take it from here. All right, thank you, Representative Haley and uh, Baker and Leader Doubt. Um, as Barb said, I'm Mike Harvey, superintendent of Zambroda Mazeppa Schools. I'm a parent. I've served in the, class, in the classroom as a teacher, I've been a coach, I've been a principal, and, and now lead a district as a superintendent. Schools are complex and they're a vital fabric of our communities. So I wanna just share with you a few things that, that have happened as a result of, of, of some of the executive orders. And, and really as, as what has been already um, spoken about, we've had very, very little input into this and oftentimes are only invited in afterwards to clean up the ap aftermath of some of the items in the executive orders that maybe haven't been thought out. So starting this spring with executive order 20-19, basically it created a unilateral change in uh, placement and services for special ed students and, and students that qualify under section 504 of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Basically, we, re, we do a lot in schools for kids. Um, and part of that education is we literally, as part of some of the, these plans, we feed kids, we help kids walk, we provide physical therapy, uh, occupational therapy. Um, we, have, we supply adaptive equipment so that kids can, can read and learn in the school environment. Um, the order this spring immediately placed those kids in their homes we were not allowed to provide those services in their homes, and we were not allowed to provide those services or bring those kids back to the school. 
So those kids were, were really a, abandoned uh, this spring. Um, we, we tried to contact our, our representatives, but they couldn't do anything because of the, the way that the current executive order was written. So we were di directed to not do those services. Um, for two months then, we worked with begging parents and teachers who wanted to provide these services, um, but we couldn't. And the real threat then for COVID-19 for these families was the loss of education because of what could not happen because of the executive order. And it went on for two months. I understand that if, if, if something happens and it's not quite what we wanted it to be, won't we make adjustments? Why would we let that carry on for two months? And that was, that was the first one I want to talk to. And then last week when the executive order came out, and it basically says that we're, we're to provide an additional 30 minutes of prep time for teachers per day. That 30, 30 minutes might not seem like a lot, but it really, again, falls on the backs of the kids. It, it is over two weeks of instruction in the rest of this calendar, in the rest of this school year. That's two weeks of lost instruction for the kids. That's two weeks of additional daycare for the families as they try to cover the time that, that, that the kids are not gonna be in school because of the executive order. So we wanna make sure that we're thinking these things through. 30 minutes changes everything in schools. It changes bus routes. Do we even have bus drivers that can, can transport kids at these different times? Um, it, it, it changes our entire schedule in, in the school. It has, it has a, lot of, a lot of effects, uh, impacts that I don't know that were always thought out. There were lead, leading organizations in our state you know, the Minnesota School Boards Association, which represents all the elected officials in all the districts across the state, um, they weren't at the table. Um, MAZA, which represents all the, the superintendents, they weren't at the table when these decisions were made. And as a result, there were a lot of unintended consequences that, that came out of that executive order and that we're still trying to figure out how we're gonna do this by the third year. Um, and now we have executive orders that really are in conflict with executive orders. You know, we're, we're given an order that the regular hours of instruction for in-person and for students who are distance learning need to be maintained, that we maintain those same hours. But then the new executive order last week also said that they strongly encourage us to not do this um, synchronously, to do it asynchronously, meaning not at the same time. So the, the issue is how are teachers supposed to maintain the same hours for both groups when they're teaching online students and in-person students and maintain the same hours, but not do it at the same time. So we have executive orders. At this point, there's, there's so many executive orders, they're starting to conflict with each other. So it, it would be nice that when we see some of those executive orders that are coming out, and, and many of them have so much stuff in them that they're almost like an omnibus bill, that it, it would be nice for the legislature to take a look at it and say, you know what, this makes sense but this really doesn't, and it, it really needs to be thought out more. And just having that ability with the legislature might encourage the governor to invite more people into the conversation prior to the decisions being made. But overall, I moved by, by the efforts, um, the work and the understanding of teachers, school leaders, parents, and the students uh, all this year. Uh, they stepped up to the plate every single time. Uh, for that, I'm very grateful. What gets in the way of all this good work are executive orders that change the rules in the middle of the game. So now families have to readjust. Now students have to readjust. Um, and, and in the end, they're the ones that have to pay for, for these changes. So I encourage the legislature to get more involved, provide oversight into what is happening to our, our children and our families. Um, more thorough discussions need to be had with the larger community before decisions are made. Together, we, all of us, um, have the best interest of everyone in mind and the best interest of, of our kids' education, but not having input from a larger set of representatives and perspectives means that there will be winners and losers in the decisions. And we don't want our children and families to be on the short end of, of, of that list. Um, please involve the voice of our leadership organizations in these decisions. This is not happening enough and include the provision in House File 
4657. So that does not happen again in Minnesota. And if it does, the Minnesota le legislature would be able to take a step in and um, make it right again for students and families. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Harvey. I think you've heard a uh, really good commentary this morning uh, from our hospitality industry and, and our superintendents. Uh, again, we believe this is a reasonable approach that gets the legislature back to the table and, and frankly allows us to do our jobs. Our jobs are to represent <laughs> these restaurant owners and these teachers and these superintendents and these parents. And we are being shut out of that process right now. So that is our goal. Um, I think we can open it up for any questions right now. All right, Representative Haley, we have a question in the chat from Kevin Featherly. Uh, how CFL leaders suggested this isn't a serious effort because if I'm paraphrasing accurately, they weren't given a heads up on this legislation. Doesn't sound like they're going to entertain it. What's your, what's your response to that? Well, thank you uh, for the question, uh, Kevin. It's uh, it, disappointing to hear that, and it just kind of sounds like politics as usual. Um, this bill isn't a surprise. Representative Haley has introduced it at past uh, special sessions. Um, I personally talked to Melissa about this days ago. Um, you know, and 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 I think I, I'm disappointed in uh, the Democrats in the House uh, who who really have been unwilling to find the creative solutions that will encourage collaboration and, and get us all working together. I think Minnesotans really have a, a very simple expectation: is that all of our elected officials will work together. I think we have a rich tradition of divided government in Minnesota. We saw that again this election, um, and and uh, you know Minnesotans wanted us to to frankly work together. So I think it's 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 really important that they kind of do a little uh, <laughs> self reflection and 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 come to the table uh, and and really try to figure out how we can better collaborate and and work together. And and th there's almost no better way to do that. Um, than, than literally something like this. So Barb, I wanna thank her for, for bringing this bill forward. Um, disappointing that, that Democrats would even suggest that this was a surprise when I know she has introduced it in previous legislative sessions. So, um, uh, you know, our hope is that they'll, they'll see the light here. This is a very, very common sense, very minimal change. And I would be shocked, frankly, if, if Democrats didn't support doing this. Um, so we'll, we'll look forward to a conversation on the House floor today, but I really would be shocked if they didn't accept this provision. Representative Haley, did you want to weigh in at all? Yes, thank you, Leader Dowd. Um, I'd like to add that Representative Baker and I have been on the phone uh, for a week, <laughs> every day, day and into the evening, reaching out to our DFL colleagues. This is a very sincere proposal. Um, I don't play it any other way. That's how I work. That's how Representative Baker works. And we have been talking to them and, and listening to their input and answering their questions uh, for, for a week. So um, to say that there hasn't been any involvement uh, really is not true. All right, uh, Esme, did you want to unmute yourself and go ahead with your question? Yeah, um, I have a question. What exactly is your plan for, for dealing with COVID? I know that this is addressing the emergency powers and getting you folks more involved in that, but you, many of you have been very critical along of the governor's specific plans. Leader Doubt, what is your plan to deal with this crisis? Our plan would be much more collaboration. Uh, it would be including the legislature. It would be including the people who are actually impacted by the executive orders. Um, that means talking to the restaurant owners through the hospitality association. That means talking to school superintendents, bringing them to the table. It's very difficult to, uh, you know, from a, a, a residence on Summit Avenue, uh, to know how these executive orders are going to impact every school district across the state without actually talking to school superintendents. So um, we're disappointed in the level of, of collaboration that, that this governor has chosen or lack of collaration. Um, and, and frankly, we would be much more inclusive. Um, I have what specifically list, would you do? I, ha I have a list of, of uh, requests as long as my arm uh, that have not been responded to by the governor's office. Um, and, and it's very difficult for us to, uh, 
you know, come up with complete plans and to feel like we're even involved at all, or even answer questions from our constituents when we're not provided some of the most basic information about what's happening with COVID across the state. Number one, and I've been very clear from the beginning about things that I would have done differently. Um, I would have uh, locked down nursing homes earlier instead of transferring COVID positive patients into nursing homes. Um, I think that's something that could have saved a lot of lives early on. I think we also can't ignore uh, the data and the science behind COVID. And, and you know, what I mean by that is, uh, if you are a student in a school in the state of Minnesota, COVID is, is uh, two or 3,000 times less severe for you than it is for somebody who's, who's right now living in a nursing home. And we can't pretend that there's not that significant difference. Um, and we can't treat those two populations the same. So I would have a, 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 a a resolution to this that would, uh, frankly, allow our school students to be back in school um, to get the education that they deserve. Um, and if somebody has, and the default would be in the classroom, and if somebody has a reason that they have a, a, a reason not to be in a classroom, maybe somebody is a high risk in their home, um, then they can uh, certainly uh, choose to do a distance learning option. But I'm, I, I'm fearful that we're going to have an entire uh, group of kids who are going to be a year behind in school because the distance learning isn't meeting the, the requirements that those kids and families have. And the kids who are going to be impacted the most are going to be kids who are most impacted by the achievement gap, our low income and our minority students. And, and frankly, uh, we can't ignore that. Um, but the data is very clear. Those kids are at very low risk, not only for uh, for infecting uh, with COVID, but they're at even lower risk for transmitting it. Um, uh, so we can't ignore the body of data that's out there now since kids have been back in school in, in many, many states. Um, and, and we can get kids in school safely. Um, and I think we owe it to our kids to do that. All right, Dave Oreck, did you want to unmute yourself? Uh, Peter Callahan. Hi, um, I'm going to go ahead and skip down and ask Dave's question that he typed in below because you talked to uh, uh, Representative Dow, you talked about uh, uh, sort of a, a reckoning that people need to have in this eight months in. And, and I'm curious as to whether Republicans need to have a reckoning about the uh, even demonization, but certainly ridicule of masks and mask wearing mask mandates from the president on down at events in this state. And if Republicans can't even be asked to help promote a basic public health uh, task such as that, you know, I'm sort of wondering what uh, you would be willing to do that is more damaging perhaps to the economy or more difficult to the economy. Is it time to look back and say that those uh, res that resistance was a mistake at this point? Thank you, uh, Peter, and and thank you, uh, Dave, for for typing in that question. I appreciate uh, both of you uh, bringing that forward. You know, we this isn't about. Uh, in, in our press conference today and the bill that we're bringing the floor isn't about ending mask mandates or anything like that. This literally is about just the governor working better with the legislature. Um, everybody in the state of Minnesota, as I have said many, many times, need to take COVID seriously. Uh, there is no question. The surge that we're experiencing right now um, is something that people need to pay attention to. This isn't about ending that. This bill will not end a mask mandate. It will not put people at risk. What it will do is it will get the governor to work with the legislature more. And that's our only uh, goal in, in, in bringing this forward. So um, I, I think your question, uh, well, it's good. I think it's a, a, a bit unfair because it, it certainly, um, you know, doesn't uh, take into fact that what we're trying to accomplish here is we're trying to get the governor to work with the legislature. And there is no question um, that he has not done that up to this point. And, and what we want him to know from this is that, that he will have very willing partners in working with him to analyze the data and make the decisions to keep Minnesotans safe. Everybody's priority is to make sure that we keep Minnesotans safe. And I think we're all hoping for a vaccine uh, very quickly. And it looks like that's probably going to be coming in the next month or two. So um, we're excited for that. We're excited for this all to be over and to put it all behind us. But in the meantime, I want everybody to take it seriously. Um, but that also means our governor needs to work with the legislature, to work with the business owners, uh, to work with restaurant uh, operators, to work with school superintendents, and to work with everybody who is impacted by the executive orders that he's uh, deciding. And, and frankly, we think every Minnesotan supports that. 
Yeah, if I could comment to that too um, um, on that question, um, and I have shared with Governor, or uh, sorry, Commissioner Grove, as a Republican, I know that this mask question always gets really wonky and got real political during this uh, last several months. And I and I and I think what I am doing right now is trying to do everything I can do to help business. And I'm encouraging um, folks in my district as a Republican to do the best job we can in washing your hands, wearing your masks, and watching distancing. It's the same exact message that we've been hearing from um, a lot of politicians across the country. What I'm hearing now, though, is that we can do a better job in that because businesses are asking us to, to start encouraging that more. Um, because the problem is, is if uh, uh, in, in a restaurant setting, somebody walks in with a mask, they sit down, they take it off, they have a drink, they eat. The problem, some of this is, is that they walk around the restaurant, they go get popcorn, they use the restroom. We need to remind them that if you could put a mask on when you leave the table, that would be very helpful. A lot of people around that restaurant want to be out and socialize. Right now, the numbers are scaring everybody, and I get that. But we, uh, we can do a better job to encourage more uh, washing and wearing and all those things. Masking, though, should not be looked at as taking a knee to the governor. Not at all. It should not be. It's part of our process of getting to the vaccine that I think is coming in a few months. And I, I appreciate the work the federal government has been doing to get us to that point. We can do a better job. And I've shared with, uh, with Commissioner Grove, if you need a Republican to help encourage that, I'm there. In fact, right now, I'm writing a letter to the editor with another Democrat member up in his district to encourage their community to wear uh, more masks and wash hands so that it's a bipartisan message. We can do better, but it isn't the Republicans' fault because we haven't gotten on the same excitement level of just wearing a mask is going to solve this thing. Uh, it is not, that's not the only thing. I wanted to just make that comment. Representative Haley, did you want to weigh in or should we move to the next one? I think we can move to the next one because the, uh, just this discussion today isn't about masks. Um, it's about process and we need to prepare for the next legislature coming in in January. That is my goal. Uh, so that we have a better process. This is a serious situation the state's in. I've had family members impacted as many of us have. So nothing that I'm doing in my bill diminishes the seriousness of this disease, diminishes the seriousness that we need to take our response, and it does not change the governor's emergency powers. So I wanna make, be very, very clear about that. Um, and uh, you can go on to your other questions, Andrew. Okay, uh, Mary LaHammer, I believe you are next. Yes, actually, I have two. I do want to follow up on this thread. Uh, Leader Doubt, can you tell me if you will be, you know, strictly encouraging and enforcing your members wearing masks and distancing, you know, the last five, six special sessions? It hasn't been consistent in the legislature. Or are you, are you going to take a harder approach to that in light of the numbers? Actually, uh, the, the numbers uh, don't change our approach. We have taken it seriously. And since the governor uh, issued a mask mandate, um, I have told our members that I expect them to wear masks on the House floor, um, and, and they have done that. Uh, and and um, obviously, I think they take them off when they're speaking into the microphone. And, and even though the governor um, exempted the legislature and legislative meetings, um, we don't think that our members of the legislature should, should treat ourselves or think of ourselves as above the law or any different than our constituents. And if we, if we feel that it's in the best interest of public safety for people to wear masks out in public, um, we're going to do it here in the legislature. We're going to show people that, that we also think that that's important to keep people safe. But today's discussion isn't about masks. It's really about getting the governor to work with the legislature again. And that's going to be our message on the House floor today. Yep, understood. And then a follow up um, kind of related, but it's related to today and perhaps the balance of power at the Capitol. Can you comment about what you know and what you're thinking about the possible change in the Senate president in the other chamber? And then, you know, the real impact is that there could be a special election. And if there's a one vote margin in that new chamber, control of the legislature could, could be in the balance here. Yeah, uh, potentially. Um, you know, my guess is that there's a, there's a lot of speculation going on as to what might happen, and and sometimes in the in the capital sphere we get uh, a few steps ahead of ourselves or trying to imagine what's going to happen. And this whole thing is is predicated on 
um, that if Amy Klobuchar would would get a uh, a position in the new uh, Biden administration, then that would create a vacancy in her Senate seat, which then would be uh, filled potentially by the lieutenant governor um, if the governor were to appoint her. And then the Senate president would ascend to lieutenant governor, um, which we've had happen right in, in the last four years here in Minnesota. So um, certainly it's it's possible, um, you know, I, I, a little bit of a chess game going on. I, it sounds like the, the, the uh, Republicans in the Senate are going to uh, join with some Democrats in electing Dave Tomasoni, uh, the Senate president, and then um, uh, that would then mean he would become lieutenant governor, and potentially then that opens up a seat uh, that that Republicans think that they could win um, in a special election. Uh, but I, you know, I think that's a whole lot of speculation, um, and we'll just wait to see how things unfold. But you think Republicans have a good shot at that seat in light of? you know, their gains in Northern Minnesota and potentially- you know, we, we, It looks like we are very close to, to uh, you know, winning that seat on, uh, at least half of that seat on the range in the House uh, race between uh, Julie Sandstead and, and Rob Farnsworth. Um, initially on, on election night, it looked like we had won it. Then it looked like there was some errors in the numbers being reported. Um, and it looks like our candidate right now is down by about 38 or 40 votes. Um, that's uh, well within the automatic recount margin. And, and so um, exciting for us that finally we're seeing that folks on the range are realizing that we're better for their jobs and better for their local economies um, than Democrats are. And, and I think they feel that Democrats who are are, are governed and managed by um, Metro, Minneapolis, St. Paul Democrats are really out of touch with uh, many of the issues that, that a lot of Minnesotans outside of the, the, the Metro ring face every day. So um, while we may fall short of winning that seat in this election, um, I think it's going to be a wake up call for anybody who serves in a rural seat as a Democrat in the legislature in Minnesota that they certainly um, need to stop falling lockstep with Metro Democrats or they will lose their seats two years from now. Thank you. All right, uh, Bill Werner is up next. Yeah, um, I have a question for Leader Dowd, and I asked Rep Representative Haley this yesterday, and she gave a pretty good answer to it, but I want to ask Leader Dowd in the, in the broader uh, caucus context. Um, why would, the, even if you are able to get this measure uh, by the, get, get Senate support for it, and, and get a bill to the governor, why would he sign it? Why would he give away uh, a, some additional power that he has now? Because, you know, if you want to cancel it now, you got to cancel the whole shooting match. Why would he let you just pick away at pieces of it and make, and make it easier uh, uh, for you to do that? Why would he sign a bill like that, Mr. Leader? You know, I, I appreciate the question. My question is, why wouldn't he? Um, why wouldn't he want to be more collaborative? Why wouldn't he want to include the legislature? And, and why wouldn't he want the legislature to have the flexibility to take a look at each executive order individually? Um, if, if, if I were to say, gosh, I'd be surprised if he took this, I would be buying into the premise that our governor really loves power and really doesn't want to give any of it up. Um, and, and while it seems like that's the case, I think this is the perfect off-ramp that allows him to uh, have more interaction and collaboration with the legislature, but but still not, but but still maintain the flexibility to to react and, and act quickly where he needs to. Um, this one seems like the very least or minimal action that he could take to collaborate with the legislature, and I think it looks like a great first step when you look at it. So. Um, I'd be really surprised if he didn't want to do this. And I think uh, more importantly, I'd be very alarmed if he didn't want to do this, because if he doesn't want to take this step, then he really does care more about the power and control than he does about working across the aisle and, and working with the legislature to do what's best for Minnesota. And that's a scary thought for me. Thanks, Mr. Leader. Okay, next up, Dana Ferguson. Hi, Representative Haley. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you chose the 30-day period um, as sort of a testing ground for these executive orders. Um, and are there any that you would be ready to amend or to strike right away if this passes? Thank you, Dana. Um, the 30-day period, basically, because that's how the emergency powers statute reads right now, and that you know we are not in session, so we are called back in. Um, every 30 days. So it is our opportunity to engage in the legislative process. So that's why uh, that makes sense. 
you know, that can change uh, when we're not in a special session anymore and we come back in in January. I think you heard this morning um, two executive orders that were put out this week uh, that we, we would recommend changes to. And on many of these, Dana, it's, it's nuances. And it's the nuances that, that are coming to us directly from our constituents that are impacted by them. You know, you heard the restaurant owner from Spicer and I heard from restaurant owners in my district, um, the, the bar issue. So does it make sense that somebody can sit at a table and have their meal and somebody can't sit at the bar that's, you know, how many distance away, have a meal and then leave the restaurant? Uh, reducing that bar capacity brings these restaurants down to maybe 35% of their capacity from the 50 which isn't sustainable. So that's their question to us is explain to, to me, Barb, why does that make sense? Well, how is that gonna reduce COVID spread? And I'm not talking about hanging out in a bar, young people at night drinking without masks. These are, this is restaurants that you know, have bar seating. So again, it's these nuances. Um, you, you heard from the superintendent uh, you know, on the, the executive order relating to um, instructional prep time is actually in conflict with current state statute on the number of hours that kids should be in school. And it has a whole trickle down effects on busing and daycare and everything else. So what we're trying to do is get in the conversation data. Uh, if you want an example, very easy example from you know months ago would be the graduation ceremony requirement. We had many districts around the state that have very small class sizes. And they spent months and months putting together safe COVID plans for you know, 20, 30, 40 students to walk up and get a diploma spread across on a football field in masks, only with their parents you know, attending. Detailed plans. And they got no response from MDE, no response from the governor. So, um, that's an example, again, that doesn't apply today, but I get, I'm trying to make the point that we want to get in the discussion and we want to represent our constituents. That is our job. And with the emergency power statute providing the governor additional tools that I agree are necessary during the COVID emergency, we don't want our tools to represent our constituents clamped down. That's the balance I'm trying to achieve. Okay. Uh, uh, Carla Holt. Hi, thanks so much. I this actually a couple of people basically addressed the surge and how this affects the timing. And I just wanted to focus on that for another moment. Given the surge, given that today there are 7,200 new cases and that at this point we have nearly 2,800 deaths, do you at all consider the proposal of this uh, to be unfortunate in terms of timing and uh, are, was there any thought given to perhaps awaiting for a week when we are not having a record number of deaths and, and how do you plan to respond and if you will justify that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Carla. And we appreciate uh, the question. Um, quite the opposite. In fact, I think uh, the, the surge and, and the surge in cases, the, the hospital uh, uh, utilization, um, all of that, um, I think even calls for the governor to work with the legislature more. Um, this isn't about stopping the governor from doing anything. There is no suggestion of that even in this uh, proposal. What this is about is just getting the legislature to work with the governor, or the, excuse me, the governor to work with the legislature. Um, and, and we just think that that's so vitally important. We think Minnesotans expect that. So um, we think that the surge makes this even more timely um, and even more important. And we hope that the governor uh, takes this opportunity. We hope that first Democrats in the, in the House take the opportunity to, to take advantage of this uh, opportunity to collaborate and work together. And then we ultimately hope the governor does as well. Um, we think this is a very important step and we think it's it's the least that they could do um, to just get the, the legislature kind of re-involved in the process. All right, uh, Theo, Keith, and then we got to wrap up and get, uh, get folks to session. Okay, I, I heard a lot about communication. The governor needs to communicate more with you. So I, I think we got that loud and clear. I, I'm gonna ask you to address another piece of this. And that is 
Uh, there seems to be a tone difference today than previous special sessions when the Senate voted on emergency powers and you guys for hours on end tried to force a vote on emergency powers. Uh, is this tone difference that's pretty loud and clear today uh, an acknowledgement that uh, this is more serious than what you guys have said it is in the past? No, I think actually the tone difference that's probably notable is that the governor, I think, saw the election results and, and realized that, oh, uh, it looks like Minnesotans do want us to work together. And we've been telling him that. We've been telling him that all along. Um, I think what you're seeing more from House Republicans today is this is a real sincere olive branch uh, to Democrats in the House and to the governor to take a very small step um, and, and move in the direction of collaboration and better communication and, and um, let's work together to keep Minnesota safe. Um, I, I do sense, and, and I've had a, a couple of calls with the governor since the election, uh, I do sense that there's been a real tone change on his part. Um, it's my understanding that Democrats thought that they were going to just sweep the election and um, they were going to win uh, the House and the Senate and we were going to have one party control for the next two years. They sincerely believed that. Um, we knew that wasn't the case and we knew that the election, uh, we could tell from talking to voters because we were out knocking on so many doors, we could tell that that wasn't the case. Um, and we do know that Minnesotans want us to work together. So um, in the Senate, we still have a uh, Republican majority in the Senate, and obviously we picked up five or six seats in the House, um, and and so we have a much narrower majority in the Minnesota House, um, and and I think that message uh, and that that tone um, is is the one that should be uh, uh, you know really recognized as as we move into this special session. And what we're attempting to do today is to let the governor know that we're serious about working with him, and that's why our tone is that we want a very sincere olive branch. Uh, out to the to the Democrats in the House and ultimately to the governor, um, that it's time for us to work together. This is a serious enough pandemic um, that that it takes all of us working together to get the best result and to make sure that we're keeping Minnesotans safe. Um, so that's our commitment, and we really hope that the governor um, and the Democrats in the House accept that that olive branch. All right, Re Representative Haley, would you like to offer any closing thoughts? Um, just appreciate everybody's time this morning, and uh, there will be I. Uh, I hope a very respectful discussion on the floor today. Again, um, this is not about uh, changing the powers. And we're very aware of the seriousness of the state that Minnesota is in. This is about preparing for the legislature to be as effective as it can be right now to deal with this crisis and going into 2021. All right, thanks everybody.